A note to the listeners, episode 60 contains some very brief and mild coarse language. Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single distinct meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. A Nun's Ars by James Mulhern. Do they still make snowflake cutouts in school, Molly? I used to love Christmas time when I was a tot. Mrs. Muldoon, I'm a senior in high school. We don't do things like that. They make snowflakes in elementary school. But a shame, she said. People at every age should make snowflakes. Nana was pouring coffee and arranging anisette cookies on a plate. I agree, Mary. Oh, those cookies look better than the Chinese food they deliver every night. The restaurant insists I call in the order, but I don't. It's the queerest thing. Let's have a gin and tonic instead of that coffee, Agnella, Mrs. Muldoon said. Molly, too. She's a senior in high school now. Alcohol wouldn't go with the cookies, Nana said. Nana set the coffee and plate of cookies on the table. Did I tell you Molly's IQ is 148? Whatever that means, Mrs. Muldoon said. Do they teach you your catechisms at school, Molly? The sisters explain all of that to us, but I don't believe any of it. She tisked, tisked. You are not smarter than God, young lady. She placed her cup down firmly. Coffee spilled over the rim. Molly is a free thinker, Nana said. What a bunch of malarkey, Mrs. Muldoon guffawed. I've got to use the little girl's room. When Mrs. Muldoon left the kitchen, Nana whispered, Grab a few of those see-through balls from her Christmas tree. Hurry up. Nana stuffed the ornaments in her bag, just as we heard the toilet flush down the hall. Mrs. Muldoon returned and said, I was just thinking about Vivian Vance from I Love Lucy. It's sad that she died. I wonder what a dead body looks like. I'd love to see one, I said. What an odd thing to desire, Mrs. Muldoon snickered. And I don't see why her death is more tragic than the death of anyone else, I answered. Do you know there's approximately 153,400 deaths per day? A little more than 100 per minute. We are all specks of dust in an enormous universe. Imagine, specks of dust. I don't even know what she's talking about. Wanting to see a dead body, too? Jesus, Mary and Joseph, Mrs. Muldoon said. Don't mind her, Mary. She's just a free thinker. I could tell her a few things to think about. Her things sounded like tings, and her think sounded like tink. We should get going. The snow is falling again, and Molly's got homework to do. I can't wait to add more ornaments to our Christmas tree, so it can be just as beautiful as Mrs. Muldoon's, I said. Yes, yes, Nana said, rising from her seat. Later, as I lay on Nana's bed doing math, I picked up the phone and dialed. This is Mrs. Muldoon, I said. Send me some pork fried rice and egg rolls in a jiffy. I'm so hungry, I could eat a nun's arse through a convent gate. Hello there, welcome to No Extra Words, the flash fiction podcast. My name is Chris Baker Darsh, I'm your producer and editor. We're all pretending to be someone we are not today. I know Molly is, and I think it could be argued that Mrs. Muldoon is as well as Nana. And to be honest, so am I a little bit. I'm going to be brutally honest with you all today and tell you the truth about podcasting. And the truth about podcasting is sometimes it's not glamorous, and sometimes you don't want to do it. And since this is a solo project and my deadlines are all self-imposed, I was having the kind of day where I just didn't want to do it. I didn't want to record, I just wanted to go watch reruns of Friends. And I could, because again, it's a self-imposed deadline, but I decided to be a martyr to my cause, and so I was ready to put on the hat and be good podcaster and fake it. But here's the thing, when you tell people things in your own voice, it's remarkably hard to fake. I'm not an actress, and it's hard to be something I'm not, but the thing that propelled me to really get on my horse today and feel good about what I was doing is an email I got from M. So M writes that she's a longtime listener to the show. Hi, M. And it was fun to hear that because we've been going for over a year now. So I guess that's what long time time listener classifies as. So that was really fun to hear. And she writes that she's probably going to send some pieces in at some point when I feel confident enough to. And what I wanted to say to that is to M and to anyone else listening who feels that way, I would love to read your story. I think so the submissions that are my favorite are from the listeners because they can talk a little bit about the show too. And it's super fun. So remember... You're just a writer sitting in your house doing what you do, 
and I'm just a podcaster sitting in my basement doing what I do. I know how hard it is to submit. I've been there. But trust me, we're all human. We're all just doing the best we can with this. So don't be afraid, Em. And she writes, this isn't about that. And she said, would I consider doing a sci-fi episode this month sometime to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Star Trek? And here's what I want to say to Em in response. First of all, I love that suggestion. And the reason I'm talking about it on the show is because what I love about it is it shows how much you know about me in the show because you know that a random thing will come into my head. And I'm thinking, I should do an episode on that. And the reason is because it keeps this process from becoming too monotonous for me. The other answer I'm going to give you is when we get sci-fi stories, I almost always run them. I don't turn a lot of sci-fi stories down. Sci-fi is really hard to accomplish in flash fiction. And when people are able to do it, I love to bring it to you. Of course, we do plan pretty far in advance for these episodes. So September was already mapped out a long time before I got M's email, and I couldn't really throw together a special for this month. But what I'm going to tell M is you caused me, who is not a Trekkie, to look up a little bit about the show because I was curious and I wanted to know if there's any way that it tied together. And what I learned is everything old is new again. And Star Trek is actually kind of... It was described in many places to me as sort of that Western style happening in space. I don't know if that's true or not, but it sounded like fun to me. And it did make me think a little bit about the story coming up next, because the story coming up next is really hard to place in any particular kind of category. I will say that it's about Joan Galt. And for the literary among us, that's a joke that we probably get. And when it came from the address of somebody that said she was Joan Galt, I started to wonder if she was in on the joke or if I was dealing with a crazy person. And it felt very real and it felt very happening now, even though it's fiction. But yet it's also crazy futuristic. And it was, I kept describing to my husband, so I'm going to run this story the end of September and I just don't know what to make of it. I don't want to know what to make of the lady who wrote it. I don't know what to make of how it fits into anything. But what I will say about it is it is 100% refreshingly original, which I do think at the end of the day makes an interesting tribute to Star Trek. So, M, I did a little bit of a stretch. I, I'm sure you would agree with me on that. But I wanted to acknowledge your email. I wanted to acknowledge that you're listening. And I wanted to say to everybody out there, please don't be afraid to send crazy suggestions to noextrawords at gmail.com. Some of them I just might take. So coming up, the Termite Squad, my official and authentic report by the one and only Joan Galt. I will see you guys in October. It's me. Who is Joan Galt? If you're reading this, I'm assuming who's Joan Galt has been the number one search term in the past 24 hours. Maybe for a whole week. Lots of interest, lots of theories. Who is Joan Galt? I'm assuming everyone is going to want to know. My light is ebbing, you could say. By now, it's probably snuffed out, but you never know. Before it's extinguished completely, while I'm still able to influence what's said about me in the Twittersphere and the annals of history, which is sort of the same thing, right? I need to answer the who is she question, definitively, because I'm the only one who can. Yes, people, this is me, the real Joan Galt, not an avatar. I exist. I'm not a character the government concocted to scare you, like Pervez Gasman Shaw or Mindy the White Scorpion. I'm real. Who is Joan Galt? They'll say I was a terrorist. A criminal. They'll say I was a menace to society, the toxic tumor of a diseased civilization. The news commentators and twit lords will offer smart-seeming theories. They'll say I was a symbol of the national mood, a receptacle for our worst fears and impulses, or whatever sounds good at the time. They'll hashtag me evil. The truth is not what they're going to try to tell you when I'm dead. The truth is not the multimedia events they'll concoct, or the wiki entry they'll repeatedly edit to their satisfaction. The truth is, I'm just a girl who wanted the world to be a better place. 
My Great Idea Before I came along, the ongoing success of the Termite Squad was built on one key assumption. Old ladies can get away with more than the average person. Ladies in general, of course, but especially old ladies. 100 years or more. Centenarians. Or centurions, as the kids say. Have you ever met a woman born in 2000 or earlier? They like to complain. Even though life expectancy is around, like, what, 104 these days? Her lost looks, her reduced pension, her ruinous health care costs, and she'll remind you repeatedly about how she didn't have to desalinate everything back in the day, how water used to be free, and you didn't need a wind-gathering license. Not hating on them. Old ladies are permitted to deliver soliloquies because they're totally entitled to. Just like they're entitled to cut in line. They do what they want. Very few of us complain. Of course we don't. They're old. They're adorable. The rudeness is sort of cute in a way, like a puppy. We understand. No one likes to say no to the elderly, to a frail and wizened woman who looks like your mother. No one wants to disappoint her mother. When an old lady asks for help, she usually gets help. When an old lady asks for a little favor, some special treatment, she usually gets special treatment. Even when she's wearing an end vest. My great idea was a simple idea. Keep the ladies, add the sexy. Those were my exact words. That's exactly what I said to the director of operations when they brought me in to make my pitch. I had cashed in all my banked favors and got the meeting, the face-to-face -face kind, right there in Langley. I knew I had only a few minutes to get their attention and hold it. Keep the ladies, add the sexy, I said, smiling my best. I'm just a sassy little girl with a lot of moxie smile. It worked. There were perfectly good reasons at first to restrict the termite squad to centurions, to women a hundred or more years old. The most obvious being that they really could die any day. Plus, everyone involved in national security knew that the elders' strategy would be detected and defeated eventually. Argentina had already started denying entry visas to foreign citizens with mobility issues, and chatter in the diplomatic community suggested that Malaysia and Turkey were considering similar anti cripple legislation. So now, termite squad recruiters were looking for high-mobility centurions, ladies who didn't need a chair. But still, the bad guys were starting to put their guard up. They were on the lookout for shriveled super seniors. It occurred to me the day I got my diagnosis. Why do you have to be old to be a hero? Why can't you be a hero when you're young and vivacious and still have your figure? Keep the ladies, add the sexy. I'm 28, okay? I don't look like the usual termite. I have above average Liker stats, above average worth score. Not bragging, but thanks to a fairly extensive network of personal feeds, my profile has been shared on the homepage of some very important sites. Hashtag just being real. I dated LaDante Mook briefly and Gareth Sparks slightly longer. And that's not to mention some of my fleeting hookups, which I'm sure you're already checking. Search away. I'm not one to kiss and post. But at this point, I guess I can reveal that I had one dreamy night with Harry Spencer. And no, I'm not kidding. Check your arm. Put in our two names plus Mumbai. You'll see. And yes, it was everything you would imagine it would be. Like one of his virtual movies, but real. Hashtag delicious. Eventually, I connected with the man of my dreams, my JJ, and those boys became nothing to me but fond memories. I wouldn't trade them. The point is, looks matter, right? Youth matters. I didn't make the rules, I just play by them. So I impressed upon the director that a potential termite's ability to gain access was what made her valuable. The more access to powerful people, the better. I told him, not many people can say no to a sweet old lady. Even fewer can say no to a sweet young one. The termite squad's director of operations, who was officially separated from his wife when I met him, totally got my message. 
Oregon me. Or both. But he got it. I hope you do too. I hope you understand. We're all going to die. Some of us are just meant to be an attractive corpse. I'm kidding, but I'm not. You know what I mean? I didn't plan my life out wanting to die young. I didn't want to be a martyr. No matter how expertly you've calibrated your algo chip, sometimes life decides certain things for you. It's out of your hands. When that happens, you just have to make the best of it. For me, it was an easy decision. When I got the diagnosis, it was a very easy decision. I wanted to be a member of the termite squad. There's always a boy. I understand. You want to know if someone put me up to this, if I'm a victim. Answer, the only thing I'm a victim of is loving too much, loving too deeply. That's the truth. But I know it's not going to satisfy most of you. You want the whole story, the dirt. Okay, fine. Let me ask you though, can love, real love, ever be dirty? If you think it can, we're probably going to have a hard time connecting with each other, because I still believe that pure love is too strong to be contaminated. I told you I was a romantic, the hopeless kind. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever been in love? Not really liked a lot. Not totally in lust with. Loved. Like the one true love of your life. The person who completes you. Then you know how I felt when I met the love of my life. I knew. When that happened, the question was not, would I do anything for him? The question was, what wouldn't I do for him? For the record, as clearly as I can state this for all posterity, Jonah Jones did not and does not and never will support my decision. He's probably against it. The decision is mine, and I'm so sorry if he doesn't agree with it. But I still love him. I always will. I love you, Jonah, and I hope he'll still love me forever, even when I'm not there. Have you been tested? Before you judge me, please get tested. The results will almost surely be negative. The important thing is that you'll know. You won't have to live with a lingering, annoying, irritating doubt. You'll be clear on who you are and what you are and where you're heading. If your diagnosis comes back like mine, well, I hope you'll do the right thing. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.